Welcome everybody. Good afternoon, morning, evening, wherever you are. We have participants from all over the world. This is fantastic. My name is Claudia Vaez Camargo. I'm head of public governance at the Basel Institute on Governance, and I will be moderating this panel entitled Harnessing the Intangible, Enhancing Integrity During Crisis. I think it's not an understatement to say that COVID pandemic caught us off guard. The health emergency has been exacerbated in many countries by compromised governance systems and yes, corruption too. We have unfortunately too many cases of detected corruption pertaining to, for example, emergency procurements of protective equipment. And now also with the vaccine distribution and delivery, we're unfortunately also seeing cases of abuse of power and fraud that are emerging. So we know that even during the best of times, formal rules are often not followed for a variety of reasons. We also know that such issues that underpinned the so-called implementation gap can be exacerbated during times of crisis. So this panel deals precisely with unpacking and understanding some of the intangible yet hugely impactful factors that shape behaviors and decision-making in manners that preclude the effectiveness of anti-corruption controls and accountability mechanisms. So with that as the backdrop, it is my pleasure to introduce our panel for the discussion today. I'm particularly happy that we have brought together a truly multidisciplinary group, bringing insights from the fields of public health, behavioral sciences, and yes, of course, also anti-corruption. Um, I, I would like to first just say that uh, due to unexpected circumstances, uh, Dina Balavanova's presentation will be taken up by Eleanor Hutchinson, although Dina is also here with us and she will make a more limited contribution. So Dina Malabanova is a professor in health systems and policy at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. She specializes in health system strengthening and governance in low and middle income countries. She leads a research portfolio on anti-corruption, including the Accountability in Action project in Nigeria and Malawi. Ellen Hutchinson is an assistant professor in anthropology and health systems at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. She specializes in ethnographic research into public and private sector health system governance. She leads research on corruption in the medicines retail sector in Uganda and works with Dina to run the ethnographic component of the Accountability in Action project. Ruth Persian is a senior research advisor at the Behavioral Insights team in London. She has a background in economics and her work focuses on supporting improvements in public service delivery in low and middle income countries and building capacity in the application of behavioral insights and rigorous evaluation. Last but not least, David Jackson leads the U4's anti a corruption Competence Center uh, thematic work on social norms and the politics of anti-corruption. His research explores how an understanding of social norms, patron, client, politics, and informal practices can lead to anti-corruption interventions that are better suited to context. His PhD examined these topics in Kosovo. So a little bit of housekeeping before we start. The session is organized as follows. We have two rounds of presentations where our panelists will discuss first, what are those intangible or informal issues that they have encountered in their work that affect the implementation of formal accountability mechanisms and which can become exacerbated during times of crisis. Each panelist will have eight minutes for the presentation. Then we will go directly to a second round of questions and, and, and interventions where our panelists will discuss the practical implications of their findings and how this, these findings can inform policy responses and the development of better anti-corruption interventions. So again, we ask the panelists to keep their interventions to eight minutes at the most. After that, we will open to questions from the, for, from the audience. So we would really like to encourage a lively Q&A and therefore we're asking all participants to feel free to write your questions in the chat box. Um, because we have a considerably large number of participants, uh, the questions and comments will be visible only to myself and to the panelists. So don't be disappointed if you do not see much chat activity going on, but please we do encourage you to ask as many questions as you like. 
Um, we will be keeping track and hopefully identifying themes and recurrent questions so that we can answer as much as we can within the time we have. Um, one final note, please be aware that we will be recording the webinar and it may be public, it will be made public in parts or in its entirety. So without further delay, let us begin with the presentations and um, Eleanor, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Claudia. I'm just going to bring my presentation up. Great, it's a real pleasure to be here today. Um, great to see so many participants here. I'm going to be discussing some research that we have been doing with the University of Nigeria. So it's a partnership between the University of Nigeria and the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. So I'll be discussing findings uh, that we've gathered between Dina Balabanova, Abina um, Onwujekwe, Martin McGee, and a team of researchers from Anugu. So our research that we've been doing across lots of different countries, I'm going to focus on Nigeria today, but we've been doing it across a range of countries, really begins with a frustration with traditional approaches to corruption in public health. I think this is a frustration that others probably share with us and certainly across different sectors. There has been, I think, a frustration on frustration with approaches that really focus for the most part on accountability and transparency measures um, as key anti-corruption tools and which rarely consider the context in which these accountability and transparency measures are meant to take hold and meant to have an impact. One of the key things that they don't often do then is think about the power of those who are expected to introduce anti-corruption strategies. And we're going to think about this in terms of networks um, during our presentation today. But really, you know, a, a sort of key failure has been in terms of policymakers or people proposing policy, sort of thinking through who is going to be able to implement a strategy that we propose, who is going to be willing on the one hand and who's going to be able to call others to account. We also think that these earlier or traditional approaches to corruption in public health have been less interested in the range of reasons that there are as to why corruption practi corrupt practices appear. Um, and, and we'll be teasing these out through the presentation, but I think in particular, we need to understand that sometimes in health systems that are very stretched or in health systems where there isn't enough funding for decent salaries and for commodities, corruption can sometimes solve problems. Informal payments can sometimes subsidize poor salaries. And this is really critical, I suppose, for the second part of the discussion, when we're thinking about you know, what we're going to do and how we're going to sort of shift corruption that we may well need to solve problems in the health system as we are trying to solve informal practices and corruption at the same time. So we're really, we see ourselves very much as part of a more general call for new approaches to anti-corruption that have, that have occurred across different sectors. Um, so new approaches to anti-corruption and policy that take context, social relations and political networks into account. So these are the three areas. And although, as I've said, we've looked at this across different countries, I'm just going to talk about Nigeria, the Nigerian health system and the research that we've done in terms of absenteeism. So a quick word, I think, also though about COVID-19 before I start, because although clearly COVID has been a shock across the world and continues to be, in Nigeria, the health system experiences regular disruptions in terms of availability of staff, access to commodities, but also in terms of the infrastructure. So COVID needs to be understood in this context in which shortcuts and informalities are used very often to manage disruptions and to manage crises. Of course, corruption exacerbates the crisis and it exacerbates the crisis that we see at the moment. And absenteeism is a critical problem that exists in the Nigerian health system. It exists among different cadres of staff Obviously, it exists in different health systems as well, but we, what we're advocating for is, is an approach that really understands absenteeism in its context. So we talk about absenteeism sometimes as one thing, but our research has demonstrated that it's not. It's a range of different practices coming when health workers come late, when health workers leave early, when health workers come for fewer days each week or month and they're contracted to do so and when health workers don't ever come to work, when they never appear, which some of them do. And what we've seen in our research is that different types of networks seem to shape these different forms of absenteeism, and so we'll need different forms of intervention in order to manage them. 
So let's think about these different networks and what I'm just going to present very briefly to you. So the political networks that run through the health system also run through, of course, the staff in the health system because they are party to the same systems of everyone else in the society. And what we found are that strong political networks, so patronage and clientelism are associated with nurses. So we focused very much on nurses and absenteeism because they are the most numerous health workers in the system. That political networks are associated with nurses who come to work very rarely or don't come to work at all. What happens, as I think people, people may know about sort of other sectors, is that political actors within government will compensate supporters by giving them positions within public systems. So here, political actors in local government, but also in higher for, the sort of larger forms of government, will compensate their supporters by giving them positions within health facilities. And these people that get positions through these political networks are very often absent. But there are also another sort of number of factors that then influences the way in which absenteeism is managed because the officers in charge of health facilities so the nurse managers running you know primary health facilities right at the front line don't know who is and isn't supported by these networks um, and they're very careful about whether they can um, sanction a particular health worker because what happens if, if you try and sanction a, a health worker who has been put in their position through these political actors, it can have very serious consequences for your own career. So we've heard of officers in charge and heads of department who run local government who have reported the wrong health worker. So a health worker who's been absent but who is politically connected and they then lose their jobs. The officer in charge and the head of department will lose their job and the absent health worker will stay in post. So there are very serious consequences. So when we're thinking about who it is who's going to pick up on your anti-corruption strategy, we need to know about the consequences for the people who are going to do that. We also, though, see networks amongst um, health workers. So these are more sort of social networks amongst health workers who are working within the health system. And these tend to be networks within one, for example, primary healthcare facility. And within these networks, nurses may organise shifts within a single facility to reduce the working time of each nurse. So that may be the first thing that happens. But these happen at different grades. So we found one health facility, for example, where the nurses network started organizing volunteers to cover their shifts. And then the nurses very rarely came to work. So that we found, you know, in one case, a single nurse would come to work every, uh, one nurse would come to work every six weeks. So the health, the, this primary health um, facility was run primarily by volunteers. And then this linked to another form of corruption, which is informal payments. These payments were used then to cover the salaries of the volunteer staff who were effectively running the health system. Just going to look at time. Yeah. And so the final um, network that I want to raise for us to think about is different, I think, in terms of quality, whereas the other two, the political network and also the sort of social network amongst health staff may offer opportunities for corruption or opportunities for absenteeism. Family networks and gendered norms seem to drive nurses into absenteeism that they would rather not be involved in. So what we see here is absenteeism that ties in with the care economy and women's double burden of work. So family networks and gendered norms driving ad hoc days off, driving nurses coming late and leaving early and driving nurses to refuse to cover night shifts in some rural areas. And we see this as sort of driven by gendered roles within families. So, so demands that women care for children, demands that women care for sick family members, that they return home to do domestic work rather than stay at home means that they may come late, leave early. But there are also gendered norms about you know, the places that women should be. So female nurses working in rural areas report that their husbands don't want women to work at night far away from their families. And these also, I think, tie in then, if we come back to the beginning of the presentation, with the sort of with the difficulties of working in a health system that is underfunded, because women also report themselves that they're frightened sometimes to work at night in rural areas where there isn't protection, there aren't any fences, there aren't any night watchmen. So I'm going to stop my presentation there. I think all of these different um, strategies demand, or these different sort of networks demand different strategies in which to manage them. But I know that we're going to go on and talk about that. But Dina, um, I'm just going to hand over to you just for a couple of minutes, just to tie up. One minute. Thank you very much, Eleanor. Uh, this is really highlighting the work that our teams are doing in the field over the past few years. 
I just wanted to summarize. So we have a situation where we have a chronic crisis in a country with very little resources in the health system. So when we talk about disruptions due to COVID, they're sometimes not the main disruption. So we need to be really aware this is what is happening. So what are the implications of this? At the facility, front, we're working at the front line and district, up to district level. And basically what we see is that the formal rules and procedures are not fit for purpose very often. So to cope with this constant crisis, people have to do certain things. People, I mean, providers, majors, um, different health workers, they have to adapt the procedures. So they have to break the rules or they have to, mm, they have to venture in a gray area. Very often when we say you did that and actually is that legal? Is that allowed? And they'll tell us, we don't know. We just did it because we have to cope. We provided the care or we did what we had to do. And I think uh, they hire additional workers to sometimes work for free. We, we don't know still, our researchers are right now in the field, but this great, these strange spaces, which are gray areas where people adapt practice, it's just the formal rules don't work. And then the next, during COVID, we see what we see right now is a lot of new spaces opening and shortcuts. So we see this in high income countries as well with all the contracting area where all these shortcuts and, and venturing in these gray or illicit areas is starting to be justified as a response because the official, the formal rules don't work and you have to respond to COVID or you have to respond in a gap in provision. People come with health needs, you have to treat them. So ultimately, I think this is what we see, this constant crisis and that's why our whole, I would say, in one sentence approach and understanding has been that just trying to fix the formal regulations, which seems to be the approach of many international organizations, doesn't work because these, a lot of these rules are not fit for purpose anyway. So trying to tinker with them to fix them, you don't really go far. And I hope in the next section, we'll talk more about what, what else we can do. Thanks so much, Eleanor and Dina. This is fascinating. Already a lot of questions coming to my mind. Uh, and you're just starting to, you know, uh, scratch the surface at how multidimensional the topics that we're exploring really are. But without much ado, um, over to Ruth to talk from the perspective of behavioral science. Ruth, the floor is yours. Great, thank you, Claudia. I was very um, eager to get my slides up. Sorry for that. Um, great, yeah, Claudia, as you said, I'll talk a bit about what behavioral science has to say about decision making and behavior. So I'm not an anti corruption expert. Um, I work for the behavioral insights team. We, uh, we um, apply insight from the behavioral sciences to different policy areas. Um, Claudia and I do co uh, work on a on an anti-corruption project um, at the moment, and I'll talk about that later. But yeah, I'll just give a bit of um, an overview of what behavioral science, which is the combination of social psychology, um, behavioral, um, sorry, um, neuroscience and behavioral economics um, has to offer. So um, traditionally systems, both in public policy and elsewhere are designed around this idea of a rational actor. So if you've ever studied economics, um, you will be familiar with this idea that human beings are rational and they weigh up all costs and benefits and um, before making a decision, before deciding on the next, next step. Now, um, this model is quite helpful, um, but it's not actually what the real world looks like. Um, the way Daniel Kahneman, who got a Nobel Prize for his work on um, behavioral science, um, put it was, it turns out that the environmental effects on behavior are a lot stronger than most people expect. What traditional economics tends to focus on is this system two, which Kahneman um, describe. So that's one way that people make decisions. And that's the slow thinking, the reflective, deliberate, analytic decision making. So if I give you a difficult math problem, or a, a trip that you've never taken before to plan, your system too will be working. So you will be thinking deliberately about your different options. Um, you might take out a pen, a pen and paper to do the math, or you might research the trip overseas. And um, this is, yeah, our deliberate thinking. This is closer to the rational actor model. Now, the thing is, we also have the system one, as Kahneman describes it, which is fast thinking, automatic, intuitive and effortless. So if I give you a math problem like two by two, or if you're taking your daily commute, um, you won't really be thinking about the different steps. You'll just, you know, get on with it. 
and your, your response will be automa um, almost automatic or will be automatic. Now, the thing is that system one is a lot more important than most people um, think and than most, uh, that, than most people who design systems um, think. System one is actually quite important. If we were only using system two for everything from getting out of bed to um, you know, going back to bed in the evening, we wouldn't get anywhere because system one actually allows us to be efficient. The thing is, it's also a lot more susceptible to environmental influences and biases. Um, and this is why it's so important to keep system, um, system one in mind when we design systems. This is even more important when we design systems that have to work under stress. Um, and I'll talk about how that's related to COVID in a bit, because there's evidence that shows that system one is more likely to take over when we're under stress and when we're under threat. So think about it um, like our ancestors when they were somewhere out in the wild and they saw a big animal, they didn't have a lot of time to think about, oh, is this an animal I've seen before? Is it, you know, do you, I think it's dangerous? Um, do I think the teeth, you know, could kill me? They just had to run. And that was system one, that was an automatic response. So it's really important to keep in mind system one is hugely important, but it's also susceptible to biases or we're more likely to make errors, all these things. Now, I wanna briefly talk about two, two groups of decision makers that I think have been um, really brought to public attention during COVID. Um, one is policymakers, so politicians and civil servants who have to make decisions such as whether to um, go into another lockdown, um, how to roll out a vaccine, all these things. Um, under a lot of risk and uncertainty and a lot of public scrutiny. And the second group is obviously frontline health workers who have to make decisions under a lot of pressure. Um, let's go to the to policymakers first. And not surprisingly, policymakers are, are humans too. So they are susceptible to exactly the same biases. Um, and this is actually a replication of a Kahneman and Tversky study. Um, that shows this quite nicely. Um, this is an experiment you might be familiar with. I think originally it's called the Asian disease um, experiment, but it was actually way before COVID. Um, but it's about this disease that threatens um, 600 people. Now, um, the, the subject participating in the experiment is presented with a situation. They have to make a decision um, about a cure that can save some of those people or that prevents some of those people from dying. Now, the thing is, these people are entered into two different groups. One group is um, presented with what we call a gain frame. And the second group is what we uh, presented with what we call a loss frame. So the way it works is that the gain group has to make a decision between treatment A, um, which will allow, allow 200 out of the 600 people to live, to survive, um, and treatment B, which has a one-third possibility of saving all and a two-third possibility of saving no one. That's the great gain frame. Group two is presented with two slightly different treatments. Treatment A um, is a treatment where 400 people will die. Treatment B is a treatment um, with a one-third possibility of no one dying, a two-third possibility of everyone will dying. What we see and um, is that um, in the gain frame, a lot fewer people take option B, which works with possibilities, so with risks, than option A, than in the loss frame. And this is a really nice replication of um, Kahneman and Tversky's finding that the way decisions are presented to us, even if in the substance they are the same, um, that matters because everyone who did the math in their head just now would, would have um, figured out that actually all scenarios and all treatments have the same expected outcome. 200 people dying, uh, 400 people dying, 200 people surviving. But the way the decision is framed makes a big difference. And this replication was with roughly 380 parliamentarians across four countries. So this very specific segment of the population that is making these decisions also under COVID. A few of my colleagues um, summarized all these different biases and also outlined potential solutions a few years ago in a report called Behavioral Government, um, using behavioral science to improve how governments make decisions. And they focus on these framing um, issues. They focus around how, uh, on how groups um, interact and also how biases matter for execution. So in case anyone is interested, um, feel free to have a look at that. Now let's move on to medical professionals um, and how we can support them through choice architecture. As I already said, um, these people make decisions under, under huge pressure. They have to make decisions in split seconds and um, behavioral science has a lot of potential to help these people make better decisions 
um, supporting them making the decisions they actually want to make. And this is a nice illustration of how this can be done in a really low cost and really simple way in a complex system. And um, this is a study by Dominic King, who um, collaborated with us back at the time. And it's about how through a simple redesign of prescription um, forms, we can actually support frontline professionals to, um, to make fewer errors. What they found was that the existing prescription um, guidelines in the NHS in the UK um, for hospitals were very much focused around this idea of a rational human being. If you get, give someone all the information, all the training that they need, as you can see there at the top right corner, which has a lot of like granular, you know, do this, do that, and um, then they will make the right um, choices, they will um, not make any errors, and um, they will, you know, get on with their job and do all the right things. Now, what the researchers actually found was that that was not the case. Um, I just took one example, one, one of the outcomes from their study, um, and in this, the standard charts, only around 10% of prescriptions had actually the medication frequency entered correctly. So quite an important thing, um, how often should you take your meds, um, was only entered correctly about 10% of the time. Now, what the researchers in the study did is they redesigned the chart, the prescription start, the chart, from giving these guidelines to actually designing the chart in a way that makes it very easy to enter the necessary information correctly. Um, so we would call that a timely prompt. Rather than asking someone to read through all these guidelines, you just, you just create the environment, you design the environment in a way that helps them. And what they found was that this massively increased the likelihood of a prescription actually having the correct medication frequency in their study. And I think this is just a really nice um, example of how we can support people um, who are working under stress, who are using their system one, who will rely on habits a lot more and who will respond to environmental cues a lot more to make the right decision. Now you might say, what does this have to, uh, to do with corruption? Um, not very much in this case, but I think what I just wanted to show is um, how we can design systems to, to support decisions um, for people who want to make the right decisions anyways. So essentially going with the grain, doing something people want to do. And I think it's really important to acknowledge, and I think Dina and Eleanor already touched on this earlier, was that not all bad decisions and rule breaking behavior is actually intentional. Quite often people just respond to the environment and this can be social cues, this can be norms, but this can also just be the physical environment in a way that's maybe not, not optimal. This is of course not to say that there aren't also cases where people um, for whatever reasons decide to break the rules intentionally. Um, and this is just a quick, a short overview, and I think David will talk about that a bit more, um, of different psychologi psychological factors that can drive, that might, may drive corruption. Um, again, I won't go into these in, in detail, but these are just findings from, from different strands of the literature. For example, that people um, find it acceptable to cheat or to steal a bit of money if it's only a bit, um, or that they are more likely to cheat if it's sort of their last opportunity um, to do so. Um, so yeah, um, with that, I'll hand over to David and I'll talk a bit more about some of our current work with Claudia and how this uses behavioral science in a bit. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you. I will um, share my screen. I hope everyone can see that. So thank you. Um, First of all, Eleanor and uh, Ruth and Dina, these were really interesting presentations. And of course, thank you to Claudia for organizing the panel. So we see many reasons uh, for corruption in the health sector, institutional deficits, uh, poor transparency, difficulty of monitoring uh, actors um, and so forth. What I want to do today is to try to convince you that social norms are part of that story. And I want to do in this short intervention just three things. First of all, describe what social norms are, explain how they relate to the health systems, and then finally, just a few observations on the role of social norms within this emergency situation of COVID-19. So what are social norms? Um, there we go. 
Uh, so social norms. So the big headline is that social norms are shared expectations about what is common or appropriate behavior. So there are many definitions out there, but I think that one sums it up quite nicely. So social norms regulate all sorts of behavior in our life. How to behave at parties, what to wear in the office, but also how politicians should behave, how public officials should act. And we have social norms in society because they provide predictability of relations. They are a channel by which we can express our identities and they provide social cohesion. But let's look a bit more closely at what they are. So I think to understand them, we just need to deconstruct a little bit this idea of social norms. And first we have to uh, start off with the recognition that we are all part of reference groups. So we're all part of social groups. Um, these could be community groups, they could be village groups, they could be professional groups, cultural groups, ethnic groups. So most of us are part of many different reference groups. And these are important to us because they form part of our identity. And within each reference groups, we can find some collectively held uh, attitudes um, or rules, and these are social norms. So social norms always relate to some kind of reference group. Um, so the first message is that we belong to many different reference groups. Therefore, in our lives, we have many different social norms. There's a constellation of social norms um, directing our behavior. And social norms can be positive or they can be negative. They can promote resilient behaviors or they can um, promote uh, damaging behaviors. The context always matters for understanding social norms. But a key message is that because social norms are the rules or the collectively held uh, attitudes of a group, they trump or they are different from personal attitudes and they can be in tension at one another. So for example, uh, there may be some norms which dictate what you should wear in your office when we used to work in offices and you may really dislike the kind of clothes that you were that you were um, supposed to wear so your personal attitude towards the norm may be um, awkward but still you follow the social norm because that is the collectively held attitude of the group but we need to make a distinction between different types of social norms. And this distinction relates to why we follow them and the kind of sanctions that these norms bring. So we have some social norms that we follow because it's common behavior. These are called descriptive norms. So for example, I give an informal payment to a nurse or doctor because that's what everyone else does. That's what I perceive it is the common thing to do. And Violating this norm normally brings perhaps some material disadvantage, but then there are other social norms which we call injunctive norms. And we follow these because we believe that others believe it is socially appropriate. So for example, I give an informal payment to a nurse or doctor because I believe that others believe it is the right thing to do. So you are showing gratitude for that. And uh, these injunctive norms tend to be a bit more rooted in society because there is a social sting to violating these injunctive norms. If you violate something that others perceive as appropriate, then perhaps you will feel guilt. So these are the kind of psychological mechanisms. So these internalized sanctions that you'd face, or you may face externally um, executed sanctions. You may, people may gossip about you, people may um, talk bad about you or excommunicate you from the community. So injunctive norms, you tend to face social sanctions if, if violated. And all these create social pressures. Social pressures, uh, therefore, I think are a reference point for people's behavior. Um, and we see this in the health system. So what I want to do now is just to explain some of the social pressures we've seen. And I was so 
uh, glad to see that uh, both Eleanor and Ruth have, have already talked about some of these pressures, so I can be relatively quick. But I think the point here is that under or many uh, or the actors within a health system may face various social pressures at the same time. Um, and these, this category of uh, social pressures that I want to offer uh, relates uh, to a category, I guess, of, of, of reference groups. So first of all, for example, if you are, um, if you are a, an ordinary patient, uh, why do you decide to pay in informal payments? Well, it could be that uh, you know, you're a member of society, a general member of society, and in society, there is a, a norm that we have to return favors. And actually psychological research bears this out. People don't like when favors aren't returned. So maybe you see your health service, your um, treatment as a kind of act of support from a doctor or nurse rather than a right. So you feel, okay, I, I have to give something back in return. Um, this doesn't necessarily lead or cause the informal payment, but it, um, it, um, it makes the situation a bit more ambiguous um, and maybe more difficult to say no. Okay, but why does a nurse, for example, or a doctor, why do they accept these informal payments? Well, they could be under uh, pressures from their family. And I think this is a, another important um, category of pressure that is from your extended kinship network or your immediate family. And this idea of family first, I think uh, research suggests is, is a very important um, norm uh, within society, especially for public officials. And we see a lot of uh, favoritism because uh, um, doctors or, or nurses may feel that they have, to, um, uh, they have to give preferential treatment to members of their kin. If they do not, then they will face these social sanctions. And we actually see that there is quite a strong correlation between the strength or the importance of family ties in society and, and levels of corruption. But what this category also suggests is, is that not all the norms that relate to corruption are, are direct. So family first in and of itself is a positive norm or can be a positive norm, but placed in the context of public service, then uh, a... Um, conflict is, is kind of um, activated and it becomes problematic. Okay, why are, why do, for example, office workers skim or embezzle funds? And uh, another reference groups, which Elena mentioned about uh, kind of organizational or, or the, the peer, peer networks of nurses. Um, so I would call this a kind of horizontal reference group and I, the norms there can be something like all my colleagues are doing this and we see that in many societies there are unofficial codes of conduct so the nurses for example may have an unofficial set of norms which they adhere to and this again creates social pressures finally we also see kind of vertical pressures and i think this relates to what eleanor described as these political networks and we see norms there around deference and around loyalty uh, and again, these can create um, pressures to be corrupt. So what is the significance of all this? Um, well, I think this, the main significance is that norms provide constraints to reforms. Uh, and this is the main message, I think, also coming from Elena and Ruth, that we need to take into account these reference points of behavior when designing reforms. So, is there much point introducing new laws when people follow the informal rules or the informal norms? Is there much point introducing a code of conduct which can be perfectly designed when there, is, there are unofficial codes of conduct which seem to be more uh, salient? Um, is there much point doing uh, managerial reforms or introducing new uh, managers when vertical, the norms within vertical patron client networks dictate certain kinds of behaviors. So I think a message is, a key message is that 
social norms should be taken into account when designing uh, reform processes. And then just finally on, on social norms in response to COVID-19. So the reason uh, uh, we haven't discussed the emergency directly is because a colleague uh, uh, of mine, Daniela, who works at U4 on Health, uh, helped me by kind of reviewing, okay, what's out there? And we didn't find any hard conclusions or, or, or evidence, but what we have is a few observations. So in emergency situations, I think social norms matter probably more. Ruth has described this as kind of people being under stress, so therefore kind of acting more intuitively rather than responding to institutions. So they, they matter more, but we don't know how they matter or how they will matter. Again, it could be positive or it could be negative. And I think um, more research is needed to understand uh, the evolving situation here, but we should also stress that social norms is just one perspective. We cannot be sure that social norms explain all kinds of behavior. In fact, there may be a lot of corruption in which there aren't social norms involved. If, I mean, the threshold for social norms to be involved is quite high. You need to have, be clear that there's a reference group, there's an, a rule within the reference group, and that there are sanctions there to enforce these rules. So a lot of corruption schemes and opportunist acts may not involve social norms. And I think we need to look, especially from within the anti-corruption community, look a lot more at the social norms of elites. So I think a lot of the research which has been done has looked at frontline workers, it's looked at citizens, uh, it's looked at petty corruption. But what we see emerging is a lot of um, violations of integrity amongst elites. And it's, it's excellent that Ruth has this, uh, Ruth cited this survey, which actually looked at policymakers or parliamentarians. Uh, look, um, and I think uh, within an anti-corruption, we need to do a lot more on looking at elite behaviors. And then finally, um, it's quite an obvious point, but we, we will see many kind of documents emerging, offering guidance on COVID-19. And um, we see in, for example, in South Africa that they've, they've, they've published recently a, a, an anti-corruption framework, which is um, great to see, but we don't see social norms being discussed within those policy frameworks. So we would encourage uh, those to be included. Okay, that's all from me, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. This is fascinating. And I, I think it's, it, it's really quite crucial to understand how, you know, on the one hand, we have laws and social and, and formal um, rules that represent, you know, the best, best practices or represent what we as individuals and societies, institutions in our best behavior would strive to achieve. And I think it's quite uh, sobering how, you know, the research increasingly is showing us how in practice we are subject to this, you know, plethora of influences, uh, pressures and even biases that might or even might not be um, uh, consciously um, understood when we are in the middle of a, taking a decision. So I think it's quite crucial uh, to start concentrating thinking on how we can harvest this kind of, uh, of knowledge into better um, policy making and better uh, practice. So Eleanor and Dina, um, it's fantastic how you have highlighted the importance of, uh, of these different types of networks on the behaviors on, of health workers. And obviously this has a consequence on health outcomes. So can you give us some ideas of what context sensitive strategies or interventions that can help improve governance in the health sector could look like taking into account the findings of your research. I'll go first and I'll hand over to, to Dina after that. Thanks very much. It was absolutely fascinating and really good to see the connections between our presentations. They seem to sort of reinforce each other in many ways. And I think so we've been working a lot with um, uh, so as Ace, uh, Mushtaq Khan and Pallavi Roy, um, in terms of sort of thinking about the strategies that you could use once you know, you know, what do you do once you know about all of these networks out there? How do you manage them? How do you change policy? 
And I suppose the sort of overall sort of overarching umbrella is that you cannot have any blueprints anymore, that you need to engage with these networks and understand them. And I think really for me, one of the sort of key strategies that they suggest is that you, you take the differences between groups that we often think of as homogenous, you take those seriously and you work with those. So in our research, for example, thinking about, you know, which health workers, because absenteeism, you know, well, it really benefits some of the health workers who I think can probably are, are going off to work elsewhere. So they get a double income, if you like, one from their public sector salary and one from maybe working in private medicine or elsewhere. They, so while it really benefits some of the health workers, there are a lot of health workers for whom it creates no benefits at all. And actually it creates a lot of stress because they are then having to pick up the work that isn't done by their colleagues. They're having to work longer hours and to be at the health facility more. So I think forms of collective action amongst those health workers. So thinking about, as I said in the initial slide, you know, who is going to support your anti-corruption strategy? It's not enough that the policymakers might support it. It's not enough that it looks technically as though it will work on paper, but actually that you have to find different groups within the health system who are going to support that. And I, a lot of work that um, Dina has done and I've done um, with her project has been on thinking about who those people are. You know, who is it who's powerful enough to support your strategy and will go with that strategy because they're incredibly strong these networks um, but people very often find them incredibly unfair and are very angry about them especially the political networks so I think that there is there is will to create more more collective action there but on the other hand you also have to invest in health systems at the same time you know you have to make sure that if you are as a, a really brilliant paper um, about sort of trying to get rid of informal payments, for example, in the Ugandan health system. And the worry that if you don't increase health workers' salaries and you stamp out informal payments at the same time, that you will end up with health workers simply leaving the health system because they can't afford um, to be there. So I'm going to stop there and hand over to Dina. Thank you very much, very good points. And a lot of our research has been not really describing just the drivers of corruption, what are the circumstances, but trying to think of solutions. And I think at the moment we are doing a discrete choice experiment, actually asking doctors to choose. And one thing that came up and it's not yet published, but really interesting is if you show doctors in Bangladesh different jobs and they choose, what are the attributes they like? It wasn't always about increasing their salary. What they prioritize is security, and, and good relationship with the local community. Why? Because there is a lot of attacks on doctors and they actually value being there and protected. That, that was not intuitive. People always think, oh, if we just improve working conditions and we have better regulation. But we saw something completely different. They're saying they want to be protected. They want, if they have a problem, to go to somebody locally, not somebody in the health system, by the way, a powerful person who can protect them. But I wanted to raise just two quick issues as a way forward. I think that what we have seen, and we have done several literature reviews, our team as a whole, we see that uh, policymakers within the health system find it quite difficult to engage with this sort of range of uh, drivers of corruption circumstances, including social norms. So anything to do with the social and humane aspect of interactions between people, it seems like there is not much clarity on what can be done from the within health system. For example, you have now health insurance systems being rolled out and uh, a lot of regulations and trying to formalize payments and make it, uh, for example, cash free. But the gifts, the exchanges, the, the social pressure, the sociability is still there. And it's posing a very often a double burden. And, this, if you read a lot of reports on maternal care, for example, uh, you will find no mention of informal payments. And you really think whether these are big initiatives and they really don't engage with that because I think the presumption is if you put more money and more resources in the system, these payments and these practices will disappear. But we know this is not the case. And the, the other thing I would like to say, and something that we see in Nigeria, but I think there is potential in many countries. So if you think of uh, Eleanor talked about corruption as problem solving, and very often people break the rules and they make their own rules because the rules don't make sense, the formal rules. So we know that there is a massive investment in facility health committees all over Africa. 
And for example, uh, this is why we work more. Uh, and it's really interesting because some of the work to understand how they can reinforce anti-corruption, they can monitor uh, absenteeism and so forth, has been focused very much, do they meet often? Do they involve the right people? Do they work well? But it's really what we are seeing, they, the evidence is very mixed. They sometimes work, they sometimes don't work to reduce corruption. I think we're missing the point and maybe focusing on structures like those, which are wrote in a quite extensive way and they're there, they really represent community and they want to do, they want to work. Very often they want to make changes, but they don't have enough power. But looking at trying to build on these social norms and achieve something around social consensus and not just think about formal structure, but can we make these committees actually more socially grounded given that they're everywhere. So there is really structure. And I know the Gates Foundation, a lot of other actors are investing in a really extensive way in those. So I think that presents something really practical and a good way to, to start and maybe do further research of how they can capture these social aspects and serve as a, not just formal, but also informally connected to the right elites and people. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Eleanor and Dina. Really very interesting insights. Uh, but let's go directly to Ruth. So Ruth, what uh, are there any examples of behavioral nudges or approaches that can help us reduce biases and enhance integrity? Yeah, it's, um, it's a good question. I'm afraid I don't have the nudge that works. Um, everyone always asks for that, regardless of policy error, if you will, you know, ask what's the, the nudge that works for tax, for health, for education, for corruption. Um, I'm afraid that doesn't exist, but I think what is really important is to recognize that corruption is really a collection of very different behaviors. And I think um, all the other presenters have already mentioned that. So um, there's corruption at the elite level, um, at the political decision-making level. There's also um, what we would call corruption um, at the delivery um, level. And all these um, behaviors have different drivers depending on context, depending on the type of, of behavior. Now, I think what behavioral insights can really do is, um, is providing this lens for understanding behavior, for interpreting what we see, and also for designing interventions that can work. And um, the reason I'm saying that I don't think there is or no one has found the one intervention that works is because behavior is so context specific. Um, because what will work in one um, one context can give you a good idea of what might work in another context. And there are you know, some interventions that work in, in um, have worked across contexts. Um, but I wouldn't want to rely on just because something works in one context, I can now ro roll it out in, in a different, um, different environment. Um, and I think a really nice um, illustration of this importance to really understand the behavior in all its nuances and detail is um, the project that Claudia and I are working on as part of the um, Global Integrity Anti-Corruption Evidence Program um, in Tanzania on tackling, um, well, what started, I think, I think we started with tackling bribery in the health sector. That was initially our title two years ago. And then um, with a lot of research, with a lot of exploratory research, we actually realized um, that it's a lot more complicated than our title um, would suggest. So what we found is that it wasn't just, you know, one sort of type of behavior of, of informal payments, but actually that there are a lot of different types, um, ways that people that patients, that users in, in health facilities, um, you know, involve in get, engage in exchanges with um, with frontline staff, um, and that these classical bribes, informal payments to, for example, jump the queue, had actually decreased massively over the previous um, sort of few years um, under the government of President Magufuli, and instead, what had still well, while these had, had decreased massively, what was still there were these gifts, um, these um, exchanges after a treatment had already been, um, been given. And I think had we not found out that this was the case, our intervention would probably have looked a lot different, um, but also potentially not actually done anything. Um, so I think this is really important, looking at what is the behavior. So are we talking about payments before um, delivery for service or after? But then also what are the drivers? And again, there, I think our exploratory, re exploratory research showed some really interesting um, sort of details. 
um, where there are two different types of, um, of gifts, one being given out of gratitude and the other one being given um, with the intention to form a relationship um, for, future, um, for future use, for future benefit with the health provider. And again, those will obviously require quite different interventions or they might have different underlying, um, underlying reasons. Um, the gratitude one being much more linked to injunctive social norms. So what do other people think is the right thing to do? What do people um, approve of? And then the, um, the instrumental reason being much more linked to descriptive social norms um, where people behave that way because they think other people do the same. Um, and they would lose out if they don't do that. So I think this is really, um, it's, it's really important to, to look into the evidence at each, um, at each um, step of, of understanding behavior, designing an intervention, and then also generating evidence by testing an intervention um, and to really understand the situation we find ourselves in. And I think what Behavioral Insights then can do is draw on all this different research. So for example, the Dan Ariely studies I mentioned around fudge factor or around um, scarcity um, that give us ideas for why we might be seeing what we're seeing and what could be done, but then to really apply it very specifically to the context. Thanks so much, Ruth. Um, over to you, David. What are your thoughts on how nor social norm strategies can be used to um, prevent corruption and enhance integrity? Yeah, thanks, Caldi. Yeah, well, I would first of all agree with, with what's been said and uh, particularly what Ruth said about it's very context specific. So you really need to understand in, uh, in very um, specific, particular situations, whether this is in a hospital or at the level of local administration, what social norms are at play, how strong they are, in what way do they influence corruption? So in a way you have to do a social norms analysis of the situation. I think that's an important first step. And uh, there are a couple of guides out there uh, to help you. So you for we, we um, included that in a paper and also the team at Tufts University also have a nice guide on, on how to understand social norms in a particular situation. Okay, but beyond understanding, um, I think what we can do is, is kind of clarify what, what we are aiming for here, because we're not aiming to kind of engineer a whole new set of social norms, really. I think the aim is really to relieve some of the more negative pressures which result from social norms, so that anti the other anti-corruption interventions can can be more effective um so you have to be really targeted and focused and, and eleanor uh, suggested this that you have to kind of segment the different networks and then engage with those those kind of segmentations so be really targeted but in terms of what kind of interventions you can do there is no social norms approach to anti-corruption, unfortunately. It's still quite a nascent field. Um, as I said before, a lot of interventions around awareness raising target personal attitudes, and personal attitudes are very different from social norms. Social norms require collective change. Um, but although there's no specific approach, we can learn a little bit from how norms have changed in other areas and actually in, in the health sector in general and, and in, in education um, there have been a number of programs looking at norms and I can just suggest a few here so one are so some interventions really about signaling signaling so kind of credible signaling about what norms are at play in society um, um, in Malaysia, with the COVID-19 situation, um, uh, they're considering making the, the list of uh, people who jump the queue transparent. Uh, or maybe, maybe they, have a, they, have a, they have a list. I'm not sure if they're making it transparent, but making it transparent would be a kind of normative intervention. So that's a very strong signal from the government that this behavior is not kind of tolerated. Then there are trendsetters. Trendsetters are kind of um, first movers who break the mold. Uh, so they break free from established norms to spearhead 
uh, change. Um, and we're seeing trendsetters emerging in this response. Um, there is in Brazil, uh, Dr. Dal Colmo, who is becoming a trendsetter by uh, really advocating for for norm for, for kind of new norms in, 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 in uh, the health system. And then there are social networks, they're leveraging social networks. And I think Claudia and Ruth have been are working on this issue about so how do you use reference groups and dialogue and discussion with, with reference groups to induce uh, new forms of behavior or more resilient norms. And I think there's also relatedly interventions around information. So a lot of people follow norms or, or negative norms, often because they have what's called pluralistic ignorance, which in which they may privately reject a norm or privately reject a behavior like corruption, but they assume that everyone else supports it. So they follow the norm. But in many cases, for example, with the nurses, it could be that many people actually uh, dislike absenteeism, but no one has revealed it collectively. So there's interventions that can, I guess, reveal information to the group, which helps overcome this kind of ignorance. But of course, all these need to be very context specific and very locally driven. Wonderful. Thank you so much uh, to all the panelists for such a fantastic, uh, um, you know, insights. So we'll open to questions now and uh, please do keep them coming. There is a, a very um, important and interesting question already in the chat. Uh, it, it's uh, been posed by, I hope I can say the name correctly, Chandni Yaishwal. And uh, the question is, you know, with all this background that we've been discussing, so is it possible to eliminate the corruption or is all the discussion about shifting corruption? And I think this is related to what's already been coming out about corruption as a problem solving tool and whether, you know, is it possible to get rid of the corruption without addressing the root causes, I suppose, or, or otherwise aren't we just ru running the risk that the corruption might either, either displace elsewhere or take a different uh, shape? So I don't know who would like to take this question first. Eleanor? I can I say, oh, sorry. I didn't sorry, see. Dina. Go ahead, go ahead. So I think it's really important to think about what it is that we can do. And I think these targeted approaches are sort of very, have, have grown out of um, the fact that, that the approaches where you tried to, to sort of stamp out corruption in its entirety just, just didn't work and weren't feasible. And I think what we're looking for much more, even though it may feel sometimes like it's not very satisfactory, is that you're looking for to tackle, you know, pockets of corruption that are very detrimental to the health system, but that can be feasibly tackled given the current context, given the power structures, given the networks that are involved. So it's um, so unsatisfactory in that you're not tackling everything, but perhaps more satisfactory in that you can target your approaches and actually get something done, something very concrete that is that is done and that that will work. Um, and I think that's one of the things that. Um, in, in terms of sort of looking at the overall research that we've done, that it seems that there are pockets, there are elements that come up that you can tackle. And I think, you know, just to think about what Ruth was saying about the sort of range of, of sort of, of um, bribery that you were finding, the, the different practices, there'll be different practices involving different networks, involving different social norms, involving, you know, different levels of, of sort of concern, if you like, as well. You know, if you don't make a payment in as your partner is giving birth, you know, does that mean that she risks dying in birth? Does it mean that she won't get the right care? So I think thinking through very, which is why you need very nuanced research, I think, to look at that. Dina, did you want to come in? Yes, um, I wanted to, uh, to continue a little bit on that and thinking from experience that I've observed, I did my PhD on the changes in Eastern Europe in the financial system and the acceptability of different financial models, including informal payments uh, for healthcare. Um, 
and one the situation in Eastern Europe in over 12 countries provided a great natural experiment because informal payments were endemic before the political transition and when the countries a lot of the countries implemented um, either social insurance system or enhanced the financing mechanisms in their tax-based system and we saw opportunity to see what happens to informal payments and look at the changing um, societal norms because suddenly people before didn't have a voice they couldn't talk about these things suddenly there are these opportunities for voice there was the internet so that was i think a great opportunity to see what happens and what we saw and i don't have a systematic study in all these countries but what i observe is what elena is saying is um it's in some areas for example particular parts of civil service municipal services we've seen a lot of very good uh, examples where people would just report if they ask for bribe to speed up something they would report it and suddenly there was um, this unacceptability so the social norms of everybody was paying no questions asked within a very short period people started viewing themselves as a consumer and started to say no and there have been a few people saying Bulgaria fired and that were, and still this has worked in some sectors there is something about other sectors the health sector which is very deeply seated so people since the health we know about health systems uh when people have a village doctor see in the 80 hundreds we know that people the village was collecting money for the doctor people are paying directly this direct payment of gratitude of and even people would say that treatment is covered by insurance social insurance they don't have to pay they're not asked to pay nobody is asking them they feel like you have to it's part of you you can't it's a bad luck not to it's really big thing you have to give something you don't have the same when you're paying for municipal service or any other civil service or teacher it's again a little bit in education so i i wanted to say to david i was really curious whether we have uh, literature or evidence on changing social norms because we've seen this quite a lot and there are triggers and very often it's triggered not by top-down regulate or that's not possible or but it's triggered by um, charismatic individuals for example on the internet or um, uh, or a group of people young people start talking on social platform and suddenly people will be saying well we shouldn't be paying so it's really interesting but it doesn't hold, I think, in the health sector. I am really kind of not sure how do you overcome this. And we see a lot of countries where there is social insurance, there is universal coverage, and um, this corruption is still there in different formats. And people don't even realize it's corruption because they're paying for consumables, not to the doctor, but the doctor takes a cut. And it's really... So one country I would like to mention, Thailand, where uh, we don't see a lot of corruption and they have expanded coverage. And I, I was wondering, we really need to look at these outliers. And I think having a societal consensus, not just individuals in pockets. So Thailand really had this drive since the 70s of equity and it became really unacceptable. And in a way, um, for doctors who want to make money, they just move to a private sector. It's not the way uh, I think the medical community, there is this ethos of self-regulation. Self, uh, um, it's not even regulation, it's informal. It's not acceptable. And when I talk to people, they said, no, nobody will do it because you will be ostracized You, if you start asking patients and then you just leave, you go abroad or you go private to work in the private sector. It's not what we see in many countries. So I think we need more research to really understand how to deal with this uh, informal aspect in an effective way. Yeah, absolutely. And and uh, I, I think maybe uh, David or, or Ruth might want to jump in. But before that, just to tag on, because this is really uh, very close to one of the questions that we're receiving. Um, Philip Mitchell is asking, is there a danger that the patients or medics that become early adopters uh, and do not uh, adopt uh, or, or accept corrupt actions will somehow suffer if they cannot pass on their illicit gain or provide the queue jump service? So this talks to what um, uh, Dina was talking about, the importance of so so societal consensus. So I, I don't know if David, Ruth, you want to elaborate your thoughts on that one?
Could I go um, quickly um, first? Because I think it also relates to the work that Claudia and I are doing and where we're designing an intervention to decrease um, these informal gifts and, and payments. Um, and I think in that, in that context, it's always really important to look at, yeah, all these um, unintended side effects as well when you're looking um, to evaluate the impact of, of something you do, be it a reform, a systems reform, be it um, be the sort of more uh, more detail oriented um, intervention um, at the at the delivery level, and it's yeah it's important to clearly outline your your theory of change to identify those risks because I do agree that this is a risk um, that early adopters might be um, might suffer as as a consequence um, and that they might either then move back to their old ways of, of doing it, or if they're very principled, um, just lose out and um, there would be concerns for their access to, to essential services. Um, that's not to say that obviously at the moment, you know, large, large parts of the population do miss out as well because they simply can't afford um, to engage in these practices um, or they can only do so at, um, at large loss to, um, to their income. Um, so I think that's important to, to keep in mind as well. But yeah, I agree this is a risk and um, this is why I would say um, we should evaluate anything we do as rigorously as possible and think about um, systematically upfront about what could go wrong and then monitor these things um, and also pull the plug on, on a reform or an intervention if that becomes necessary. Yes. Um, yeah. Thank you for the for the great questions in the chat. A lot of uh, very good ones. Um, so um, yeah, I would agree with with what's been said. Very important uh, for unintended consequences. Very important to be targeted, looking at the roots of um, of the problems we see. Uh, recognizing also that you know social norms is only one kind of route. Uh, and, and the other, the other drivers we, we we've discussed. So talking about sometimes corrupt acts of problem solving, sometimes it's a, a kind of collective action problem. Sometimes it, it can be an institutional problem also. So in a way, you need multi-pronged strategies that tackle all sorts of different different problems. Uh, but I would also agree with with Dina that you need kind of uh, deeper structural reforms and so probably these targeted reforms can only take you so far but you need the you need to achieve a social consensus i guess around welfare in society and who has the right to welfare under what conditions um and where and where these consent and how these consensuses emerge i guess is a very long story and very um country specific um so it's quite difficult to say well you need to do this 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 and this because all countries evolved this kind of um ethical universalism uh so people getting fair treatment uh, or getting the same treatment or the same access to treatment uh, 